All right, well, if you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. So for the remnant that was here Tuesday before Thanksgiving, we did get started in in Hebrews, and I'm not going to go through all of those notes again, but I just wanted to do a brief review uh, just to kind of get everybody into the headspace of the book of Hebrews. So the book of Hebrews is this anonymously written sermon, we believe, that had a letter ending, probably attached by the author, I have no reason to doubt that, uh, that was then sent out to a group of people that apparently he knew but are anonymous to us, and we don't know where they were living. So we know so little about kind of this background information that almost everything is anonymous, anonymous author, anonymous audience, uh, an an anonymous or uh, an unknown location, right, where this was going to. However, the purpose of Hebrews is actually fairly clear. The author wants to teach us about who Jesus is so that it will motivate you and I to be faithful. And so this brings us really into the headspace of the Christology of the book of Hebrews, uh, where he says, look, Jesus is king from the line of David. In other words, he is a son functionally. Maybe we could put little s, he's son of God here. And then that brought us to another point where the author argues that Jesus is also the divine son. And I'm just making this kind of artificially a capital S to denote his deity. In the author's argument, the son of God language refers always to Jesus. So uh, we, we uh, we can understand them as having both of these connotations, the function of Davidic Messiah and then the, uh, the, what we might say, the ontology or the being of who Jesus is, that he is human and divine. And then the third thing that we talked about is that Jesus is also our high priest. And this is a unique theological contribution that the book of Hebrews uh, discusses and argues for. So in that, we talked about the purpose of Jesus being our high priest. And so that brought us to this spatial diagram where we ended on Tuesday, and all I was trying to communicate when we went over this, whoops, is that particularly as displayed in the Old Testament, right, we see God's presence in the Holy of Holies. However, not everybody had access to the presence of God that was mediated by a priesthood, and specifically the high priest who could enter in once a year, Day of Atonement, into the most holy place and be in the presence of God momentarily, right? And the reason why this only happened irregularly and only under certain conditions and certain stipulations is that the presence of God is dangerous for those who are not able to stand in God's presence. In other words, those who are not holy will be destroyed. If they're sinful, they bring sin with them, they will be destroyed. And of course, Nadab and Abihu are a prime example of this. So, The presence of God was mediated by the priesthood. So we've got this concentric set of circles coming out. And God's people had to go through the priesthood to get to the presence of God or to enjoy the presence of God. Furthermore, the nations had to go through Israel who were a kingdom of priests. Notice how the biblical theological storyline all of a sudden now opens wide up for us. So Israel was given a function in the Old Testament to mediate God's presence to all the nations. So the nations would have to come through Israel, who would have to come through the priesthood, who could then enjoy the life-giving presence of God. However, the author of Hebrews argues that Jesus has gone through these concentric circles and has entered into the heavenly tabernacle, the presence of God in the heavenly sanctuary, and he has made his offering there as high priest in order to draw near you and I to God's presence so we can enjoy the presence of God. In fact, that's the author's exhortation. Draw near to God, right? Enjoy the presence of God. Enter into his presence. All of this language is throughout the book of Hebrews. All right, so that sets us up for the Christology. Here's where we'll begin today's notes. I now want to focus on what that, fee, what that Christology, that's, that presentation of who Jesus is, how that's supposed to impact our lives for today. And the author does this by talking about faith and faithfulness in his discussion. So we're going to look at an, a negative example of faith and faithfulness in the book of Hebrews, 
in other words, the primary negative example. And then we're going to look at the primary positive example of faith and faithfulness in Hebrews. And we're going to see that all of the warning passages that we usually talk about kind of in one bag, you know, the warning passages as, as if there's only, or there's a, there's a, uh, even like a, a heading, uh, you know, that was in the original letter or sermon. That's not there, but we see sporadically throughout the sermon that there's this collection of warning passages. I would argue that their sole purpose is to get you and I to be faithful. All right, so let's look at the negative example of faith and faithfulness. Look at chapter 3 and 4 in the book of Hebrews. So the author brings up the wilderness generation. <clears throat> and there's all kinds of examples that he could have pulled from in the wilderness generation, but specifically he is focusing on Kadesh Barnea. So if you remember in your Old Testament Numbers 14, the people are at the threshold of being able to enter into the land, and God says, go in and conquer the land, and Moses says, I'm going to send out some spies. They send out 12 spies. Ten of them come back. Oh, I should say it this way. All 12 of them come back and they say, the land is wonderful. It is overflowing with all kinds of goodness and bounty. Ten of them say, there's also some really big people in the land. They're really dangerous. They have walled cities. There's no way we're going to be able to take them. And they bring this disparaging report that discourages the people. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, say, true, but God will fight for us. We should still go in there and get the land. And you remember how the story unfolds. The people get discouraged, they believe the ten spies, and then God says, as punishment, as consequence for your lack of faithfulness, in other words, you did not trust me, you're going to wander for 40 years, uh, and the people try to mount up an attack, and they get crushed, and they end up wandering for 40 years. So the author brings this up. If you're looking at chapter 3, look at verse 16. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? He just finished quoting Psalm 95, which talks about how Israel uh, tested God for 40 years, and they ended up showing their own lack of faithfulness as a result of that. Look at verse 16. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was God provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter the rest of God, in other words, the promised land, because of their unbelief. So the point of the author is actually really straightforward here. Don't be like the wilderness generation. They had God's word come to them. They had God's inheritance right there in front of them. All they had to do was walk across the border, so to speak, and in, engage the enemy, start to do what God asked of them to do, and then God would fight for them. He would provide for them, and yet they refused to do that, so they failed to enter into the rest because of their lack of trust in God. Now, I want to bring out a little word play here. This is actually quite easy to make in English. Faith and faithfulness. They're both related, but I bet conceptually you think of them as different things. In your mind, I'm just going to assume, because this is the way it is in my mind, so if I'm mischaracterizing you, my apologies. Faith, I tend to think of as an internal belief and trust. Faithfulness, I tend to think as something that I do repeatedly over and over and over again. In other words, I'm given a task and I'm found to be responsible with that task, someone would say, I'm faithful. I don't necessarily think of faithfulness as like full of belief, but you can understand how the two conceptually are connected. In other words, if I trust God here, in other words, I believe him, I trust his word, to be faithful is to continually be believing and trusting, particularly when things get difficult. In other words, when suffering enters in. So the author of Hebrews also, because in Greek, the same wordplay can be made. Faith and faithfulness are related terms. And we see here that Israel believed God. However, they were not faithful when it came to obeying God and trusting him to go into the land. And so his point is relatively straightforward. Don't be like the wilderness generation who hardened their heart, right? 
and they did not trust God, and so because of that, they failed to enter into the land. So the author preaches Psalm 95. We've already talked about how he utilizes Psalm 110 to structure his entire book. He also goes in-depth on Psalm 95, and Psalm 95 he uses to refer to the Kadesh Barnea incident in Numbers 14, specifically Israel's lack of faith. If you go back to Numbers 14, 11, God tells Moses, they have not believed me. That's the sin. That's the problem at Kadesh Barnea. In other words, physic or maybe just looking at it externally, we can say, oh, they didn't enter into the land. But why did they not enter in the land? It's because they lacked trust in God. That's what the author is bringing out from Numbers 14. Their lack of faithfulness prevented them from enjoying God's inheritance. In other words, the promised land, the rest. Now, the author does some pretty unique things here. In other words, he eventually changes the referent of rest from promised land, in other words, the physical land of Israel, to something that is yet future that you and I are able to enter in. And he says, labor to enter into the future rest. So live your life now in a way that's faithful so that you can enter into the rest. However, he also says, you and I have entered the rest because of our belief. Let's look at these two, uh, two concepts here because they're both in, this cha or in chapter 4. So Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse 1. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed are entering that rest. That's a present tense verb, as he has said. So notice here the, the wordplay, faith and faithfulness. Belief brings you into the promised rest. But now go to verse 11, just a few verses later. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So there is an aspect here in Hebrews where you and I are already entering into the rest because we're believers in who Jesus is. And yet the author says that there's a fuller participation of God's rest in the future, but you've got to be faithful. You've got to continually trust God, be believing God, particularly in the midst of suffering, is what he's going to talk about, in order to enjoy the fullness of that future rest. We've seen this throughout the New Testament. There is an already aspect of your salvation, and then there is a not yet aspect of your salvation that we will participate in and the author is saying is you can enjoy some of that now by being faithful. So labor, be diligent, be steadfast in your faithfulness. He then brings up this positive example of someone who was absolutely our role model in faithfulness, and that is Jesus. So the major positive example of faithfulness is Jesus, who endured the cross in order to receive the reward. You can also go back and uh, rewatch Dr. Miller's chapel. He did an excellent job unpacking all the many things that are going on in this text. Uh, really, it's, it is the second warning passage in the book of Hebrews that's, that's right in the middle of this discussion of the wilderness generation and being faithful. Okay, so the major positive example of faithfulness is Jesus who endured the cross in order to receive his reward. Notice what we see here, being faithful, in other words, believing and trusting God, even in the midst of suffering, and the author is depicting that suffering in terms of Jesus's willingness to die, right, in obedience to the Father because he was faithful. So we're going to flip ahead to uh, chapter 11 and 12 here. Jesus is the apex, right, or the, the pinnacle of a long list of Old Testament saints who exemplified acts of faithfulness. 
So chapter 11 is appropriately called the Hall of Faith, right? The heroes of the faith. And the reason being is because there's this constant staccato or drumbeat of by faith, by faith, by faith. So if you're looking at verse 3, for example, by faith we understand that the universe was made. Verse, chapter 11, verse 4. By faith Abel offered to God. Verse 5, by faith Enoch. Uh, verse 6, without faith impossible to believe God. Verse 7, by faith Noah. Verse 8, by faith Abraham. By faith uh, Sarah. Verse 11. We could keep going, right? It's just, it's by faith, by faith, by faith. What is the author trying to do here? He wants you to have tattooed in your brain because he's just hitting it like a hammer on a, a, some kind of engraved stamp by faith, by faith, by faith. These people trusted God and they were faithful to God. Now, not perfectly. The author doesn't say that. In fact, some of them were actually quite faithful. And then others we look at and we're like, I'm really shocked that that person made the cut. So it makes sense to me that Enoch would make it in. I mean, we know just a little bit about Enoch. He walked with God, and then God took him, and he was no more. So you get this idea that God took him to his presence, right? Kind of mysterious. It's not a shocker to me that Moses made it in, although it is kind of interesting that Moses didn't make it into the promised land. Why? Because he did not trust God. If you go back and look at Numbers chapter 20, at Kadesh Barnea on a second visit. So when they came to Kadesh Barnea in Numbers 14, the children of Israel did not trust God. They ended up wandering, and they come back to Kadesh Barnea in Numbers 20, and Moses, instead of speaking to the rock to get water like God commanded, he struck the rock, and God says, because you did not separate me and keep me holy, you did not trust me, you're not going to enter the promised land either. So we know Moses is generally faithful, but not absolutely faithful. We can see Abraham. Once again, Abraham, really faithful guy, but not perfectly faithful. He lied about his wife, said that she's my sister. That created some problems in Genesis 12, right? We see these examples of people who are generally faithful, but not absolutely. And then when we get to the end of the list, the author brings up some really fascinating people. Look at verse 32. What more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon. Wow, Gideon, he's a, he's a spotty fella, right? I mean, he's not really trusting of God in the beginning, that's for sure. Keeps laying down the fleece, keeps wanting to know for sure that God is the one talking to him. Eventually, though, he gets on board. We've got also Bar Barak. Samson, oh boy, that's a tough sell. Samson, when we read the book of Judges, we don't see a whole lot of faithfulness. So now the author has gotten to his list of illustrations of those people who demonstrated faith in God and a little bit of faithfulness in God, even though maybe the majority of their life was not faithful. What's the author's point here? He's trying to help us see that we've got all of these examples of faith and faithfulness in the Old Testament to varying degrees. Some of them are pretty good, but not perfect. Some of them are not really good, but they've got a little bit. There's a wide range of, of options here. In other words, that we can take encouragement from and learn from. And at the very end of this list is chapter 12. Look at verse 1. It's Jesus. Therefore, and so this means you're supposed to read chapter 12 with chapter 11. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin <clears throat> which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So the author portrays this whole discussion in terms of a, a foot race, right? Where you and I are running, we're living life, we're putting one step in front of the other, we're being faithful. Sometimes, maybe sometimes we're not being faithful. And the author says, you need to fix your eyes on the finish line where Jesus has already run 
and where you've got all of this great, uh, you know, this, these people in the stands that are cheering you on. Some of them were really good runners. Some of them barely were runners. They barely qualified as being faithful. But they are all there as incomplete witnesses encouraging you to look to Jesus and to lay aside sin and anything else that's going to hinder you from running the race of faithfulness. And so Jesus is the one who did this perfectly. This is the author's exhortation here. So let's unpack this exhortation. First of all, lay aside everything that hinders and, of course, sin. So notice there's two different categories here. Clearly, sin hinders us. When you and I make choices to indulge sin, you are not being faithful to your king. When you and I make choices to indulge sin, when we lie to ourselves and say it's better to ask, right, forgiveness than permission, what are we doing here? We're minimizing what sin is. And I would argue that the author of Hebrews is asking you to lift up the damage that your sin does and to learn to view it like God does. In other words, don't minimize sin and say, oh yeah, the blood of Christ forgives me. That's very true. That's a very true statement. But what I find sometimes is that it's easy to think, oh, because of that, that sin does not have any consequence or any meaning anymore. And what we need to do is Make sure we understand the damage of sin and the hindrance that it causes, all the while never forgetting the sacrifice of Jesus and what it accomplishes. So lay aside everything that hinders and, of course, sin. What is it that hinders besides sin? It can be good things that get in the way of being faithful to the Lord. Distractions. There's nothing wrong with owning a TV. I own a couple of TVs in my house. But I've learned a bit about myself that sometimes TV can be a distraction from doing good things. That's just on a, like a life lesson kind of level, right? I'm not even talking about my walk with the Lord. But it's easy to understand how a good thing can get in the way of doing something that we need to be doing that's more important. And I think that's what the author is talking about here. Don't let any good thing get in the way of your faithfulness to the Lord. Set that aside. Learn to discipline yourself in that sense and run the race well. Number two, run. In other words, live your life, run your life, I should say, in a way that you're demonstrating endurance in faithfulness. So Jesus has gone before us, and you and I are imitators of Jesus. We follow in his footsteps. So when you go back and reread the Gospels on your own, you kind of have this mentality maybe, well, I should be imitating Jesus. I should be following Jesus. That's a good instinct, a good inclination. We realize though that that doesn't mean that we dress like Jesus. I don't wear ancient Mediterranean clothes and shoes, right? I, I don't try to do miracles. I'm not imitating Jesus and walking on water and that kind of stuff. What is it about Jesus that I'm to imitate? The author of Hebrews is saying, observe Jesus's faithful obedience. He trusts God, and he continually submits to God's will. He continually is believing and trusting God. Number three here, look to Jesus who endured shame. And it says, because of the joy of what was to come, specifically being seated at the right hand of God. So the Son of God, big S, took on human flesh, right? became the Davidic son, Jesus, who then suffered death and was resurrected and exalted to the right hand of God as king and high priest, and he functions in the heavenly sanctuary in the presence of God. And this was the joy that was set before him, that he would sit at God's right hand. And so he endured the shame of the cross because of this joy that was put in front of him as an option. So whenever I think of this verse, I, I often think of um, uh, all three of my kids. I was able to watch them be born, and that was quite a privilege. 
But my wife, you know, she's the one who's actually doing all the work. She's in labor, right? That's the technical term, right? She's working to get these babies out. And it's painful, right? And there's no way I can possibly relate to that. I can only have like some kind of man analogy to that, which will probably be deficient. So I'm not even going to try because that'll probably be insulting on some level. But here we've got my wife. I'm watching her labor. I'm very sympathetic. She's doing all the work. And it's amazing that when all three kids were finally born, it took like 30 seconds to a, at the most for her to adjust from pain and tears to joy and honestly laughter, right? Moving from the pain and the intense suffering that she's undergoing here to then within 30 seconds, she's now adjusted and my daughters and my son are now laying on her and she's holding them before they've even snipped the cord or cleaned up uh, the, the kids, right? There is that joy that is set before her. A every time I think of this, I think of my wife in labor because here she is, she's going through this intense suffering because of that joy that's set before her. And it happens almost instantly. Uh, not to say that she forgets the pain, right? But she's able to look past it in order to something better here. So the author tells us, you and I, number four here, Consider Jesus' endurance so that you do not grow weary because it is easy to be worn down. It's easy to give in to sin. It's easy to let the good come in the way of faithfulness. And the author says, Jesus is your example. Don't be like the wilderness generation. Believing but unfaithful ultimately, and they failed to enjoy the reward that God had for them. Instead, Jesus, who is believing and constantly faithful, that is our model of faithfulness as well. And so because of that, uh, the author says we will share that reward also. All right, the warning passages. The author works from the foundation that he is writing to believers. I think this next statement might be a bit shocking for those of you who've wrestled with the warning passages of Hebrews. There is a, I don't know what to say, there is a way of removing the author's warning passages from our jurisdiction that I hear quite frequently. People like to say one of two things. Sometimes people say, well, the warning passages teach that I can lose my salvation. Now, I don't believe that. But I think at least that's a fair reading of the text in some ways. In other words, at least someone is genuinely taking them to heart and saying, what does this mean for me? The second one, I feel like really cheapens the text. And it is to say, oh, these warning passages aren't written for Christians. They're written for those who are unsaved in the, in the author's congregation. I, I, it's the second one that bothers me the most, even though the first one theologically is very damaging, right? I don't think you can lose your salvation, but the second one means that our eyes just gloss over these words on the page of Scripture, and we just say, oh, that's for someone else. In fact, I've got a friend that this, he needs to hear this, or she needs to hear this, right? The author of Hebrews does not refer to anybody in his audience as being unsaved. They are always in the context of being written to Christians. This is actually quite easy to demonstrate. Look at uh, chapter 2. Let's walk through all five of the warning passages. Now, if you have questions on this, we'll, we can come back to it, so please just make a note of it. But I want to work through all five of these just very quickly. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. That first person plural pronoun, we, means that the author is viewing himself in the mix of those who need the warning passage. He's not saying you, those who are sitting in the congregation but who might not be believers. He's saying we, including himself. So does he doubt his own salvation? I don't think so. I think he's confident, in fact, of his own salvation, and he's actually confident of his audience's salvation. Look at chapter 4. This is the second warning passage. Verse 11, the author says, Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Right? 
us, once again, plural. He's including himself in there. He is in the mix of those who need the warning passage. Now, the third one doesn't necessarily have a, a, a we or a they, except for verse 9 when we get to that. He says, we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. So once again, he's not doubting his audience's salvation, which is the point I'm trying to make here. So that's the third one. Look at chapter 10, verse 26. Perhaps one of the most terrifying warning passages in the book. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Notice he says, if we go on sinning deliberately, I'm going to go ahead and keep reading though, because the language here gets really strong. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And notice this next sentence. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Wow, that's some really strong language. If we go on deliberately sinning, the author says that we have trampled underfoot the Son of God, profaned the blood of the covenant, and outraged the Spirit of grace, and God will judge us for doing that. Let's go to the last one, chapter 12. Verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape... When they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. And then it goes on for the next few verses to pay attention and inherit. So all of the so-called warning passages are clearly directed at those who are believers, those who are part of the we, the congregation, who have made a confession about Jesus, and now the author is exhorting them to be faithful and to not fall away, to not lose their attention span, in other words, to pay attention, to not have a hard heart, to be diligent as Jesus was. So number two here, the five warning passages never clearly spell out what the negative judgment will be, and I, I think I've got these all in your notes for you so you don't have to type anything out. But I'm trying to give you the reference here for the warning passages as they're generally understood and accepted. So the author says, how shall we escape a just retribution if we neglect so great a salvation? He doesn't tell you the negative consequence for what will happen if you do that. In other words, he does not say, if you as a believer do refuse to pay attention and you fall away, then that means you'll go to hell. He just doesn't spell it out. He kind of leaves it hanging a little bit. Kind of like when I was in junior high and my mom was like, you better clean your room. And if you don't, so help me. You know, I don't know what the so help me was, but I knew it would be negative. Could be the spoon, could be my dad coming home. I don't, did you guys get spanked with a spoon? You don't have to admit that. But anyway, uh, it was the 80s, right? Times were tough. So we, there was spankings, there was my father coming home, there were consequences for disobedience, right? And we know this, and I think this is what the author rhetorically is doing as well. There is a real negative, but he doesn't actually articulate what that is. How about the second one, Hebrews 4? Let us therefore strive to enter the rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience as the wilderness generation. Once again, he does not articulate what the negative is. What does it mean to fail to enter fully into the rest of God? The author doesn't say. I have some ideas, but the author doesn't say. Let her see here. The author says, how is it that someone, or he actually doesn't say how, because he says, what happens if someone has experienced all of these good things? They've tasted of the goodness of God. 
They've uh, experienced the power of the future age and the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, all of these different things, and then have fallen away. The author says there's no other sacrifice for sin than the one that they've already experienced. You can't go to the altar and sacrifice Jesus afresh for those sins. It's one and done. Jesus' sacrifice paid for all of our sins. Letter D here. Oh, and he doesn't give the negatives, right? Letter D, there is just the fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire. And often scholars argue that this fury of fire is hellfire. I just don't think that's true. There's nothing in the sermon that in any way points to eternal judgment in hell except for chapter 6 where the author says, all of these things we've talked about in the past, including eternal judgment, but I want to move on from talking about that, he says. So in other words, he brings up eternal judgment, not hellfire, but eternal judgment, and says, I don't want to talk about that anymore. So I don't think here he's talking about hellfire either. He's talking about, I think, the fiery presence of God's holiness that we regularly see in the Old Testament. Isaiah 6, Daniel chapter 7, Ezekiel 1. God is regularly depicted in terms of fire in his presence. And then the last one, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. And once again, the author, all of this to, to my point, that the author does not articulate clearly what the negative consequence is. Do we need him to? Like, do you really need to, for God to articulate what will happen if you continue to walk in willful sin, if you continue to be unfaithful? Or can you just take the author of Hebrews at his word that it is better to not experience that judgment and it is better to be obedient? In other words, I don't feel like I need to know all the details about what this will look like. I'm given lots of good reason for being faithfulness, for being faithful to the Lord as the Lord Jesus was and walking in his footsteps. This is what the author has said. To hear, well done, good and faithful servant, is a good motivation for being faithful. There will be good consequences that come from faithfulness. And there will be judgment, not hellfire, but judgment for those who are not faithful. So here's my conclusion, right? As you can imagine, these are debatable passages. So take this as my understanding right now, and we can talk about it. You can disagree and push back. That's fine. The author is writing to genuine believers who have trusted Jesus' work to save them, period. He's not doubting their salvation at all. Any reading of Hebrews that wants to say the author is talking about unsaved people has got to wrestle with the text, which never says that. That's something that is read into it. He knows that it is possible for them to fall away in their devotion and faithfulness to Jesus. So the real problem that the audience is struggling with is not denying Jesus or going apostate. It's by falling away in their faithfulness. In other words, not being faithful in their walk. Moral unfaithfulness. They're choosing to live in sin and minimize what Jesus has done for them. So he writes to teach them the benefits of remaining faithful and to warn them of the dire judgment of believers who fall away. Part of the benefits of faithfulness is finishing the race and receiving the prize or reward of participation in the world to come. The judgment is ambiguous, but not to be ignored. It should be a motivating factor. Okay, let's pause here and discuss this. I'm sure you've got some good questions. Yes? How do you reconcile the judgment with Romans 8.1? that there's no condemnation. Yeah, good. So Romans uh, 8, one says there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And uh, I think what Paul is talking about is because we are in Christ, that we're not going to be condemned for our sin, right? So we're not going to be, uh, in, in that sense, held accountable for our sin in terms of judgment, uh, where we stand before God and give an account of our life that way. However, even Paul himself talks about how you and I will stand before God and give an evaluation as Christians. 
So not for our sin, but for how we lived our life, whether, if I can steal the author of Hebrews' words, whether we were faithful or not. Uh, and so Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, and I think he also talks about it a little bit in Romans 8, but we, won't, we don't have to go there. It's not as clear there. But this idea that even though we are saved, we have still been given a task here. In other words, God didn't just translate us to heaven like he did Enoch. Uh, we've been given a task. We've been entrusted with a mission, and God wants us to be faithful, and we will be held accountable for that. So I don't think we'll be condemned when we stand before God as believers. We will be evaluated as to whether we um, took advantage of the good things that he provided for us in order to further his kingdom, or whether we were faithless, if that makes sense. So I think an analogy is really Israel in the Old Testament. They were believers in the sense that we have, we have a couple of times in the Pentateuch where after they come out of Israel, they believe God, they trust God, their faith is in God. However, their faithfulness as God's people was all up and down, all very spotty. And so ultimately, they did not get to enjoy the, the presence of God and the land of God. And I think there's an analogy here that way as well. Um, we could maybe also talk about even the generation that did go into the promised land. They were given the promised land up front. It was all theirs. However, because of their lack of faithfulness, they didn't walk by faith and trust God. They didn't throw out their enemies. And so because of that, they weren't able to enjoy the land the way God intended. So I think all of that is true as well. But I, does that help answer a little bit? It's not condemnation. Yeah. So does everybody at least... Um, understand my opinion, you may disagree, but where, why the author is, is not trying to, um, actually, maybe I should back up a little bit. Are we all familiar with the analogy of the carrot and the stick, you know, the cartoon character who's sitting on a donkey and he's got a, a stick with a carrot dangling on it in front of the donkey, but then he's also got another stick where he's whipping its behind. Are you guys familiar with that story? Or Okay, <laughs> that, uh, that image anyway. Positive motivation, negative motivation. So I want you at least to be able to articulate what I'm talking about here, that the negative motivation that the author provides, the stick, so to speak, is not that if you're unfaithful, you'll lose your salvation. Because the text just doesn't say that. The text constantly affirms not only the believer's trust in Jesus, but also the work of Jesus as being the sole basis and foundation for you to be able to be in the presence of God and enjoy it now and in the future, right? That never changes. There is a carrot, though, that I think the author dangles in front of us, and that is that the more you and I are faithful now, the more we can experience the wonders and blessings of the age to come right now, even though in a limited way, and that that's also going to translate into the future into some kind of reward. And he's a bit ambiguous on that, but he actually does talk about rewards a couple of times, particularly chapter 10, 11, and 12 there. All right, big letter F. This is really our final theological piece for the book of Hebrews. Jesus inaugurates or begins the new covenant in which Christians participate. Now, just by way of reminder, remember we've got two places in the Old Testament that we generally go to when we want to talk about the new covenant. Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they both talk about the new covenant. They both talk about it in terms of having the law written on uh, Judah and Israel's heart, uh, their stony heart being taken away, them being given a nice, tender, fleshy heart that will res be responsive to the Lord, and significantly them being given the Holy Spirit. And so we see here that even all the way back at Pentecost, when Peter is preaching in Acts chapter 2, he talks about uh, the, the miracles that they're seeing, the signs and wonders, and he says, this is that which was spoken of by Joel. And then he quotes Joel, and he talks about the day of the Lord and the coming of the Holy Spirit because the Jewish people were expecting that once the Messiah came and God intervened and saved them, that they would be given the Holy Spirit, that they would participate in the new covenant. So because the Old Testament really portrays the new covenant as specifically to Israel and Judah, how are we supposed to understand our relationship as Christians to that covenant? And the author of Hebrews spends several chapters unpacking the new covenant, 
In fact, it's our lengthiest citation of the Old Testament in the New Testament, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, where he's quoting Jeremiah 31 and the New Covenant. We're just going to briefly hit a couple of key thoughts here uh, just to orient you in your own reading of the text. So the first covenant, in other words, the author is referring here to the Sinai or Mosaic covenant, the one that Israel was given. We could probably go back to Exodus 19 and 20 and beyond, right, uh, where that covenant was given them, but where it was initi initiated or inaugurated through Moses as he goes up on Mount Sinai is obsolete, the author says, because of human sin. Now, I dealt with this just a little bit in my chapel on Hebrews 7 with Melchizedek. In other words, the Levitical priesthood, which is subordinate to the Melchizedekian priesthood, the problem with the Levitical priesthood is it never could bring the people to perfection. Remember what perfection was. Perfection is the completion of what God's plan is being brought into his presence. So the Levitical priesthood and the law, the Sinai covenant, were not able to actually bring the people into the presence of God. It, they, it was, neither of them had the ability to overcome human sin so that the mission might be accomplished. The, so the author here says that Jesus has now become our priest. He's high priest of the Melchizedekian order. And he also initiates or inaugurates or begins the new covenant. So the author quotes Jeremiah 31, the new covenant, to demonstrate that Jesus, high priest of a different priesthood, has begun the new covenant and that believers in Jesus share in the benefits of the new covenant now. And one of them that the author doesn't necessarily emphasize very much, but uh, is very apparent from the rest of the New Testament is the Holy Spirit, right? You and I have the Holy Spirit today. So I've got a couple of other thoughts here. God's laws are written on our hearts and minds, and you might think, wait a minute, I'm under the Old Testament Mosaic law. No, remember, what was the purpose of the law? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so here we see, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Constantly, this is throughout the New Testament as the summation of the law. We also see that God forgives sins. This is part of the author's argument uh, with the new covenant where their sins will be remembered no more. We have access to the presence of God. Of course, this being one of the central and significant themes of the author of Hebrews, that because you and I have a new priesthood, we also have a new law and or a new covenant. Maybe I should say it that way. Law might communicate the wrong thing. But we have uh, the new covenant and the purpose of all of these things is to bring you and I into the very enjoyment and benefit of the presence of God. Okay, any final thoughts on Hebrews? We're going to move to James here just to make the best use of our remaining couple of weeks. But anything in Hebrews that you'd like to talk about that we didn't cover? Yeah. How do God's laws being written on our hearts and minds differ from a conscience that anyone can have, even someone who isn't a believer? Yeah, good question. So, it seems that most humans, what we would call maybe a healthy human or a normal human, has a conscience. And uh, I, I think I stole this illustration from someone. I don't remember who it was. But uh, the, the conscience is kind of like a, a, a buzzer, you know, in your car that when you go over the speed limit, uh, you know, it kind of starts, ah, you shouldn't do that, it starts screaming at you. Uh, the problem with our consciences is, is that they can be seared and adjusted. In other words, your conscience can be really sensitive about something that God really doesn't view as a problem. Uh, it, you can be, have an overly sensitive conscience. So, for example, you don't have to raise your hand if this is true of you, but let's pretend that there's a student who comes into class a minute late and they are all broken up because they've sinned against God. That's an overly sensitive conscience, right? I mean, God wants you to be here on time, but this is not a sin issue here, right? There are things that happen. So if that's you, you need to probably relax a little bit and recalibrate. Um, your conscience is overly sensitive. Then there's some of you, though, that your conscience in a particular area is, is like barely existing, right? It's, it's practically dead. You've, you've seared that and pushed that to such a degree that you, you no longer have that warning going off in your mind when you're maybe lying or gossiping or cheating on an exam or something, right? Misrepresenting yourself. 
And so the conscience is very moldable. It's an instrument that God has given us as a human being, but it can be deformed and damaged. So that's different from God's law, which what God wants that's right and wrong does not change, right? Uh, we see that it's based on his character, on who he is. And so our conscience, and this is part of the growth process for all of us, the more we grow and mature as a Christian, our conscience becomes really kind of conformed to what God wants us to do. We start to learn things like, oh, I didn't even know that was a sin. Now I know it's a sin, so my conscience needs to adjust to that. Or really, it's not a sin to arrive a minute late for class? Okay, I got to readjust my conscience and, and work through that. So I think that is part of our maturity. Uh, all of us have to do that, if that's helpful. So your conscience is a helpful device, but it's not able to give you truth as to what is right and wrong. That's what God's Word does. Yeah, it's a great question, though. Yeah. Good, yes? Um, this is going to Hebrews 5. Just a question I've had for you over the passage is at the end talking about how um, you need solid food instead of milk. How can we distinguish that? Because I've had a hard time like, transitioning that to like, practicing that. Yeah, good question. So we have at the end of chapter five, we've got this illustration of milk and meat, right? You know, solid food. So let's look at it. Verse 14, solid food is for the mature, but uh, excuse me, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. In the previous set of verses, verse 12, he says, you ought to be teachers. You need milk, not solid food, right? And then he says, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. So I think definitely there's some doctrine and some practices that the author clearly labels as milk. He goes on in chapter 6 to bring these up. He says, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ, go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith towards God, instructions about washings, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and then here is that verse I mentioned earlier, eternal judgment. These are all the milk. In other words, when you're a new believer, these are the things that you're wrestling with and that you're going through and you're unpacking and the Lord's giving you understanding and you're talking. If you stay there, though, then the author is really kind of rebuking you and, and all of us, his own audience, because we should be moving on from those things. Not that we ever abandon them, but we build on them and grow and get a healthier diet. So what is he talking about? What is this maturity process? Well, he gives us a hint here at the end of verse 14. He says, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And I think what he's talking about here is that as we are faithful in our daily Christian life, we have the opportunity to take the events that occur to us in our life and to process them through who Jesus is and what it means to be faithful, and we learn from those. Sometimes we make mistakes and we come out on the other side and we're like, okay, I'm wiser now for having gone through that. If I were to do it again, I would trust God in this way instead of being unfaithful or doing things on my own this way. We have a, we have a whole lot of language that we use to talk about those kind of choices. And this is what the author's talking about. He's talking about doing it, being faithful. And the more we do that, the more our senses of what is right and wrong sharpen and develop. I think he's talking about wisdom, the more wisdom ultimately we get. And we begin to appreciate the meat of, of maturity. Maybe I can put it that way, you know, to take his analogy. Is that helpful at all? Yeah, it's a, it's a great text, though. All right, James is quite a different book than Hebrews, so this will be kind of an awkward 90-degree turn here. Hebrews has some very powerful exhortation, some very strong language exhortation, um, some very encouraging things exhortation, and it's all kind of centered on this Christology, like unpacking who Jesus is, is supposed to provide not only the motivation, but the, the means and the path to how you and I can be faithful. James, on the other hand, has theology, I'm not trying to say he doesn't, but it is definitely more akin to like a book of wisdom in the Old Testament, really trying to help us to discern some very practical, in fact, it's almost like there's like little sermonettes that are contained throughout the book of James that he has put together. So maybe that, 
Maybe that even explains how this letter came to be, that James is sending this letter out to a group of people who used to be his parishioners, his congregation, and he's reminding them of things that he's already taught them, but very practical book. There's, there's a good reason why we quote James so easily. So who's the author? Well, in this case, no anonymity, right? Jesus' half-brother James it's believed to be the same James as the early church leader, particularly we see him exercising his authority in Acts chapter 15. You may remember that the Jerusalem council, Paul and Barnabas and Peter give testimony as to the Gentiles being saved, not having to go through circumcision, submission to the Mosaic law. And then there's a group of believers who are pushing for no Gentiles need to be saved, and submit to the Mosaic Law. And James kind of gets up there and gives the final word on the matter. So clearly someone who has some authority in the early church. Who is the audience? Well, the text doesn't give us a whole lot of detail. James chapter 1 tells us that James is writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. So now the dispersion would have been, from an Old Testament perspective, those who were in exile, having first gone to Assyria and then the second exile to Babylon, right? But James is writing to believers who have been dispersed. So personally, I think what James is talking about, if you go back in the book of Acts, we see that early on, remember Stephen is arrested and then his, his courtroom appearance kind of works into this uh, speech, which culminates in uh, the, the Sanhedrin getting so angry with uh, Stephen that they take him outside the city and they kill him. And then it says there was persecution of Christians and they all abandoned uh, Jerusalem at this time, except for the apostles. And I think this is what James is referring to. I, it's just a guess. But I think when James is talking about those who are scattered outside Jerusalem, I wonder if he's writing after that particular uh, Acts 8 conflict to those who have sat under his preaching and teaching, and now he's writing to them to, uh, to encourage them as they've been dispersed. So this makes James one of our earliest, if not the earliest, New Testament book. So there's been several earliests that I've given you so far. We've talked about the earliest gospel of the four being Mark, right? Then when we move to Paul's letters, we talked about how it's either Galatians or 1 Thessalonians. I gave you my opinion. I think it's Galatians. Bible Project, they said 1 Thessalonians. But those are the earliest Pauline books. So now we're just kind of stepping back and saying, what's the earliest New Testament book? And James's letter is probably the earliest because if he's writing before Acts 15 and the Jerusalem Council, but he's writing after Acts 8 and the believers have been dispersed from Jerusalem, that puts it really early here, 45 to 48. Now remember, when was Jesus crucified and resurrected? Probably 33 AD, maybe 30, but 33 AD, one of those two years, 30 or 33 AD. So you're looking at, wow, 15 years from Jesus having ascended into heaven. We've got our first book here, that was written to believers. So once again, fascinating for what it says so early on that believers were not only holding to theologically, but they were also practicing as far as, in, as the early church and their worship. Okay, the purpose. James writes to provide comfort and exhortation to the scattered Jewish believers. James writes to provide comfort and exhortation to scattered Jewish believers. James talks about considering it joy when you face trials of many kind. He talks about being tempted and from, uh, by sin, how to avoid that. He talks about showing favoritism. Uh, he talks about adding works to your faith so that it's profitable. He talks about wisdom from above. He talks about, at the end, prayer and healing. All of these are topics that he's addressing to, I think, a scattered congregation, and he's writing to comfort them and exhort them to continue to be, 
excuse me, faithful.